So uh, welcome everybody to the uh, One World Mind Seminar. Uh, today, I'm really happy to have Mike Awaken here. Um, he's a professor in the electrical engineering department at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, he is uh, also an IEEE fellow um, and is well known for his work in signal processing and, and compressive sensing. I, in particular, uh, I'm a big fan of his work on uh, low dimensional submanifolds of Euclidean space and embedding them with randomized embedding techniques. So that's something that um, I really like that he's done. And he's here to tell us about another area in which he's done a lot of really great work, which are um, operators that benefit from more modern um, uh, time frequency analysis techniques. So I'll turn things over now to Mike so he can tell you uh, exactly what, what's going on with his recent research. Great, thank you very much, Mark. It's uh, really nice to have this opportunity. And uh, I wanna start by thanking my uh, collaborators on the topics that I'll be talking about, especially Zhui Zhu from the University of Denver. Uh, I think he'll be joining us for the call. He was involved in all of the theoretical aspects of the work that I'll be presenting. Also, Mark Davenport, Justin Romberg, and Santosh Karnik, who we worked with closely on quite a few of these topics as well. So this talk draws from topics in harmonic analysis and functional analysis and focuses on a particular class of operators that we'll call time-limited toplets operators. And I'll have to explain what those are, uh, but what we care about in regards to those operators are their spectral properties. So the behaviors of their eigenvalues and their eigenvectors. I'll present some theoretical analysis on those. Some of them are our results and some are from the existing literature. And then I'll talk about the relevance of all of this in some modern signal processing context, things related to super resolution and, uh, and radar imaging. So my perspective will mostly be from a signal processing uh, perspective throughout this talk, uh, but I will mention briefly a couple of, uh, of places where this is relevant to machine learning as well. So the talk is divided into three parts. And the first part, I want to talk about time-limited toplets operators. So I'll say what they are, why we care about their spectra, and, uh, and present some theoretical results on their spectra. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll specialize the discussion to a class of these operators, which we'll call time frequency limiting operators. I'll talk about their relevance and properties. And then in the third part of the talk, I'll talk about some of the applications of all this in signal processing. So before I can talk about time-limited toplets operators, I wanna talk about um, toplets operators more generally. Um, and why do we care about them, first of all? So we care about toplets operators because we care about convolution. Convolution describes the behavior of linear time invariant systems in engineering and optical systems. Uh, these convolutions occur even now in, um, in neural networks, as convolutional neural networks. Um, for those who might be unfamiliar or rusty on this topic, I'll, I'll present this kind of the way I presented in my undergraduate um, signals course. So imagine we have a, a system, let's say a continuous time system here, and um, it's characterized by its impulse response, meaning that if you were to pass some impulse, this red impulse into the system, that would provoke some response, maybe this red curve here that you see on the right. And then because the system is linear and time invariant, if you were to consider a shifted and scaled version of that impulse, like the one in green here, you would just provoke a, a shifted and scaled version of the same response from your system and, and so on for each different color that, that you see here. And then for a general input signal like X of T here shown in black, we can just think of that intuitively as being built out of this stream of continuous impulses that are coming into the system each one inducing its own similar response from the system, but scaled and, and shifted in time. And then because the system is linear, we can add all of these up at the output that gives us our, our output signal Y of T. And that's all formally described by this integral down here. At any time T, the output is given by the integral over all tau, you know, H of T minus tau times X of tau D tau. I wanna mention that even though I've described this in continuous time here, one of the aspects that I'll talk about in this talk is that many of these concepts ge generalize to other domains, uh, for example, the discrete time domain, but others as well. And I'll mention that when we get to the, the relevant parts. 
um, but it's nice to be concrete. So I, I show things with continuous time notation here. And we can view convolution. We can talk about convolution as the application of an operator, let's call it H, to your, your input signal X. And that operation is described by this convolution integral. So what do we know about this operator? Well, first it's, it's linear, as we've said. Um, because of the time invariance, then the, the kernel function H of T minus tau that appears in this operator, uh, it depends only on the time difference, T minus tau. And because of that dependence, that, that's why we call this a Toplitz operator. And as I'll show in a few minutes, that's uh, analogous to Toplitz matrices, which are, which are constant along their um, diagonal. And uh, I'm going to make now uh, a particular assumption on these operators, which is that they have a Hermitian structure. Uh, and in particular, these impulse responses, little h of t, that they have this conjugate symmetry in time. So h of negative t is the complex conjugate of, of h of t. Again, that's going to give these, these operators a Hermitian structure. So for Toplitz operators, like we're talking about here, what, what are some things that we really care about in our discussions of Toplitz operators? Well, a, a hugely important fact about convolution is that convolution in time equals multiplication in frequency. So in other words, X and H are convolved in time to give us Y. We can simply multiply their continuous time Fourier transforms, x hat of f times h of f to get y of f, the, the Fourier transform of the output signal. This is just fundamentally important in, in engineering, right? It means that we can think about the system as scaling the, the, the frequency spectrum of our input signal according to the Fourier transform of the impulse response, what we call the, the frequency response of the system. Um, as I like to say in my classes, this is why we call filtering filtering, right? Because we're passing some things through the system and we're, we might be blocking other things from getting through. And that stuff that's, that's getting through or not, those are frequencies. Some might be amplified by the system, some might be uh, attenuated. And, and this is kind of a collective description of, of filtering, but we can also view it on an individual frequency basis. And this makes the connection to the concept of a, of a spectrum. So imagine any input signal, which happens to be just a pure sinusoid, actually a complex exponential here. So e to the j, 2 pi, ft, where f is the, the frequency of that sinusoid. We could think of that as an eigenfunction of the operator in that if you were to pass that specific signal, that pure tone into the system, then what's going to come out is actually the same pure tone, but just scaled by one number. And that number is, it acts like an eigenvalue. This looks just like an eigenvalue equation with you know, matrix applied to vector equals eigenvalue times, times the vector. Um, so we see that these sinusoids, not only are they the building blocks of the Fourier transform, but they are the eigenfunctions of these Toplitz operators. And the, the, the frequency response, h hat of f, that is the collection of eigenvalues of the system as well. So we have all these connections between convolutions, Fourier transforms, and, uh, and the spectral decomposition of these operators. Um, in a moment, I'm going to change the class of operators. I'm going to do what we call this time-limiting operation to these Toplitz operators. But before I do that, this is a good place to mention that everything I've said so far actually does apply in much more general uh, context. So it's known that all of these, these topics generalize from the continuous time domain to domains which can be much more general groups. A group is, is a domain or a set where you can define a binary operation, let's say denoted by this circle here, that satisfies certain rules. Uh, on the real line, this is an addition operation. On bounded intervals, this might be like a periodic addition operation, and it can get even more exotic than that. But if you have a, a valid group, you can define a, a convolution operation that gives you a, a Toplitz operator. You can define things that are analogous to complex exponentials. You can use those as building blocks of a, a Fourier transform. You have facts, again, that convolution in time corresponds to multiplication and frequency. And you can interpret these complex exponentials as eigenfunctions of your Toplitz operator. So, all these really important concepts, they apply much more generally. And um, you can um, 
think about the, you know, what are some some other groups that you might be interested in? So uh, like the rotation group and in, in our uh, the three dimensional rotation group SO3, for example, uh, you can define convolutions on that group and that has applications in like robotic systems. You have, you know, a robot that can manipulate in certain orientations um, in SO3. And then maybe you have another robotic actuator that can also, you know, cover certain orientations in SO3. And when you say connect these two devices together, then the set of all actuations you can achieve, it's kind of like the convolution of one set with, with another set. And you can do Fourier analysis on these sets as well. Um, those groups are sometimes non-commutative, non-abelian, uh, but some of the results that I'll talk about uh, later on in this talk, they will, they will apply to what we'll call locally compact abelian groups. Um, and so some specific examples of locally compact abelian groups to just keep in the back of your mind. The one case that we've already talked about where the time domain is the real line, you can consider a finite set of the, the real line with periodic addition and, and thus circular convolution. Um, in that case, your frequency transform becomes a continuous time for a series. You can exchange the roles of time and frequency, then you get the discrete time Fourier transform. And you can also consider a time domain, which is just the integers modulo n. And this gives you the discrete time Fourier transform with discrete circular convolution. So in all of those cases, even though I'm not showing all of the notation, right? All these ideas from, from this slide, they, they apply in all of those cases. And some of the theory that I'll present in the, in the forthcoming slides will apply to these general groups. So I've talked about what toplets operators are, why they're important and why we care about their spectra. So now let me talk about what a time limited toplets operator is. So um, this is motivated by say the practical consideration that in some problems, uh, because of you know, practical considerations, an input signal might only be able to influence the output for a finite duration of time. So this original X of T that I drew here, let's say that it's only able to influence the system from some starting time zero to some ending time T. So these impulses like the green one and some of these purple ones, they no longer can influence the output values. And similarly, on the output side, y of t, perhaps we can only observe that for a finite amount of time as well, say from zero to capital T. So that's the, the, the drawing. And, and because we're changing the operator here, the mapping from input to output, we're changing our operator. Uh, I'll call this ht rather than just h. Here's a more formal description of what HT is doing. So X still appears in the convolution, but X of tau only appears from tau equals zero up to capital T. And we only evaluate this integral at times between zero and capital T as well, and, and say that it's zero otherwise. I'll talk about some more motivating applications of this in, in a few minutes. But for now, I wanna introduce the operator. And what's going to be important, again, is to understand the, the spectrum, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this operator. Um, intuitively, there should be some connection to the original non-time limited system, the one that was characterized by its frequency response. So we'd like to understand the connection between this time limited version and then the non-time limited version and how do the behavior, the spectral properties, how do they somehow converge to those of the non-time limited operator as, as T, capital T, the time limit um, increases. So this is a good place to mention that if our, if our time domain is not the real line, but rather the integers, and we do time limit this toplets operator, what we end up with is the familiar toplets matrix, right? So that's a matrix that's constant along each of the, the diagonals. So when, when I say that we want to understand the spectra of time-limited toplets operators, that includes understanding the eigenvalues of toplets matrices. Um, there, this problem is, is maybe not as easy as, as one might think, or, or the answer is not as obvious maybe as one might think. Um, in particular, you, your mind might go to, to circulate matrices. Those are ones that are constant along the diagonal, right? But once a diagonal hits the right edge, then it continues over from, from the left edge. And circular matrices 
are diagonalized by the discrete Fourier transform. And so if you want to know the eigenvalues of a circulant matrix, all you need to do is take the DFT of the top row of the matrix, which is, is very straightforward. But for Toplitz matrices, uh, things are, are less straightforward. So in just a moment, I'll show some theoretical results about the eigenvalue spectra of these time-limited Toplitz operators. But I want to mention a little more concretely some cases where we would care about these things. So first, so there are some statistical examples, some, some geometric examples, and some other signal processing examples. Uh, I guess on the statistical side, uh, covariance matrices sometimes have a toplets structure. In particular, when you're looking at random variables that come from random vectors that come from sampling a wide sense stationary random process, you'll end up with a toplets covariance matrix. And we care about the eigenvalues of that matrix. For example, if we're doing a Carhun and Lueb transform, if we're uh, trying to do dimensionality reduction to that, um, to that random vector, then uh, we would be taking an eigen decomposition of that matrix. And the number of, sig of large eigenvalues tell you uh, if, what's the limit on how far you can re linearly reduce the dimension of that random process while preserving the, the important information. Um, in, in just one slide, I'll show the connection to, to some geometric concepts. But basically, how much, how much diversity can you have say in the output of one of these linear time invariant systems, the output of a filter, um, all possible convolutions that you can get out of an LTI system, how big is that signal family in some geometric sense? Or how, if we're considering like all possible time shifts of a signal, how much diversity can there be in, in that family of signals as well? And then, and then finally, in a few minutes, I'll get to some applications in time frequency analysis. Uh, what we'll call time frequency limiting operators. And the eigenvalues of, of those operators will tell us things about, say, the information capacity of certain uh, band-limited channels, especially if we're able only to use this band-limited channel over a finite amount of time. Or similar questions, like if we have a band-limited signal, we can ask how well concentrated might that signal be in, in time as well. So all these things are, are things that we can understand once we know properties of the spectrum of a time-limited Toplitz operator. So one, one slide here on that geometric point that I mentioned. Um, imagine we have one of these convolutional linear time invariant systems, and we consider all possible output signals that we could get from this system subject to the constraint that the input signal has limited energy, let's say norm one in the L2 sense, and the input signal only affects the output. So X of tau only affects it with, when tau ranges from zero to, to capital T. So again, this time limited input that we talked about earlier. We're collecting all the possible outputs that you can get, and we're also time limiting those between zero and capital T. So it's this, this continuum of, possible signals, a uh, subset of L2 here. And it's this family of signals. Maybe we'd like to understand how big is this family kind of geometrically. Um, and one way to view this is through the language of n-widths, which, which Ron DeVore talked about about a month ago. Um, and we can measure the n-width of such a signal family. We can basically say, imagine some n-dimensional linear subspace of L2. We'll call that Sn. We can compute the distance or talk about the distance between this signal family OT and that subspace SN. And then we could say over all possible such subspaces, what's, what's the one that minimizes this distance? And what is that minimum distance to our signal family? That's the, the N width. And it turns out that's given by the square root of the nth largest eigenvalue of a certain time limited Toplitz operator the operator here is the time-limited Toplitz operator whose kernel is actually the convolution of little h with its own complex conjugate. So the little h, which is defining our, our system here. Um, so this is a connection between geometry and, and the eigenvalue spectrum of, of time-limited Toplitz operators. And, uh, and this result generalizes to, uh, to locally compact 
um, abelian groups as well. So it's not just limited to the continuous time setting that, that I've described here. So I, um, I see some notifications, there might be questions. I'll, I'll invite Mark or anyone to just interrupt me with any, I'm, I'm not very good at fielding those uh, from the chat window itself. So if you see something, uh, something I should clarify or pause, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, so there's a, there's a question that um, someone has about uh, time limited toplets uh, matrix, I guess, is a time limited limited version of a of a larger operator. Yes. And asking about um, what it means with respect to signal processing theoretically. Um, if the person who asked the question has a, any clarifications, feel free to unmute and and clarify. Uh, if there is an interpretation of what this means, I guess, in term in a signal processing context, I guess, is the question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, I see the, the question. Um, yeah, I think that you this would arise if you have either an infinitely long input signal, but, but the system only sees a finite part of it, or um, you have, uh, uh, or you're, by construction, your input signal is, is time limited. So I'll get to some, some concrete applications in a little bit. For example, we'll, we'll be looking at Sinusoids, for example, which in principle go on forever, but then we'll we'll truncate them in time, and we'll 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 let that frequency parameter range over over some bandwidth, and then we'll try to find a, an approximating subspace for these time limited sinusoids. And that'll be just one of of several you know byproducts of the sort of analysis we're doing here. So thank you for the question. So here's here's a classical result about the spectrum of these time-limited toplets operators. This is known as, as Sago's theorem. And it tells us how the eigenvalues of our time-limited toplets operator, what we're calling HT here, how they resemble the original spectrum in this context, what they call the symbol uh, of, our, of our system. Um, so H hat of F, remember that's the, uh, the frequency response or the Fourier transform of our impulse response. And in the non-time limited case, the values of H hat of F, those are the eigenvalues of our system. In this case, what, what Sego's theorem tells us is how, or at least asymptotically, that the eigenvalues of the time limited operators do converge to the values of our symbol. For example, if you take any value, any numbers A and B, and you look at what fraction of the symbol belongs to that range, um, how many frequencies are such that the, that the symbol takes a value between A and B, you have a comparable fraction of the eigenvalues of your time-limited toplets operator relative to your, your current time limit, capital T, such that in the limit, this fraction converges to the, the measure of this interval uh, shown on the right-hand side. There's different ways that Sago's theorem has been stated. Some of them look more like they're talking about the, the moments of the eigenvalues and how those will converge asymptotically to the moments of your, of your symbol. For example, the average eigenvalue converges to the average value of your symbol and so on. And this Sego's theorem can also be generalized to locally compact abelian groups, but I've just shown the notation here for continuous time. And there are other results um, about, say, the convergence of eigenvalues of toplets matrices to specific samples of your frequency response. This is in the discrete time case and so on. Um, I'll talk a little more in a few minutes about specific results about eigenvalues of these time limited operators in, in uh, the case of time frequency limiting operators. Those, in those cases, we'll, act, we'll actually be able to say some things which are non-asymptotic. We don't have to let t go to infinity to say something about the, the behavior there. But at least in kind of this level of generality, uh, it appears that, that most of the results are asymptotic. So as far as I know, it's kind of an open question to develop some really general non-asymptotic bounds here. And before I talk about time frequency limiting, there's just one last topic about uh, the general eigenvalues. So, so let's now talk about toplets matrices in particular. And suppose that we just have the matrix. We don't know anything about this longer 
um, impulse response, little h that might have that might be generating, you know, a sequence of, of larger and larger matrices. We just have one matrix. We want to know something about its eigenvalues. If this is a large matrix, it can be computationally difficult to find its eigenvalues. And so a numerical technique that people use is to a two-step process. You, you transform this toplets matrix into a circular matrix that's hopefully nearby. And then you easily compute the eigenvalues of the circular matrix by using a fast Fourier transform. One modern application of this, a recent paper by Yi, is in um, convolutional neural networks. So in convolutional neural networks, you might care about, you have these this sequence of convolutional layers, each one acting as an operator. Uh, there's a connection there between the, 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 the spectral bound or the maximum eigenvalue of, of that cascade of layers and the generalization error of your overall um, network. So that uh, is one context where a similar kind of circulant approximator has been used. We were, we were not introducing new circulant approximations here, but we were studying some of the existing ones. I'll just mention one specifically, this, this third one. So you're, you're starting with a toplets matrix and the idea is that you wanna find a circulant approximation. This strategy is to find the closest circulant matrix to your toplets matrix according to the Frobenius norm. And it turns out there's a computationally fast way to do that. We created, just to illustrate this, we created a sequence of toplets matrices generated from some symbol, which was just this triangle that we show here. And, and Sago's theorem tells us that the sorted values of this, um, of this frequency response, they should mimic the values of the toplets matrix, the eigenvalues of the toplets matrix. And indeed they do. These are the eigenvalues of a size 500 by 500 toplets matrix and the eigenvalues of each of those three circulant approximations. They're all really close. These are the errors as a function of our our matrix size n, and we see that they're all getting smaller and smaller. And, and so one thing we were able to do in this work is show that for all three of these types of circulant approximations, you do get this convergence of the eigenvalues between the toplets matrix and the circulant approximation. We considered also a more general case where we could even allow for discontinuous frequency responses or symbols. In this case, it's really only the third circulant approximator that, that gives the really good approximation performance of the eigenvalues. But for that type of circulant approximation, we were again able to prove the convergence uh, of the uh, circulant eigenvalues to those of the toplets matrix. So I wanna shift now from general time-limited toplets operators to, the, to what we're calling time frequency limiting operators. So we're just narrowing our focus. These are still time limited toplets operators, but they're ones where the, the system that we're talking about, the convolutional system, is simply an ideal low pass filter. So it's so pretty easy to think about actually. Whenever you see little h, what we're doing is, is it's a perfect band limiter. For some cutoff frequency w and minus w, that system is passing all frequency content between w and minus w with a gain of one. And then outside of that, it's just flat zero. Um, so the total bandwidth of this filter is two times W. So, so keep an eye out for the number two W on the slides that follow, because that's again, an indication of the total bandwidth of what's getting through our system. This is a classical ingredient of signal processing. We know in the time domain that such a filter uh, has an impulse response, which is a sync function. But here we'd like to understand the behavior of a time-limited toplets operator, HT, in this case. And, and thanks to Sago's theorem, we know that the eigenvalues, they should look something like the sorted values of what we have here in our, in our frequency response, some close to one and some close to zero. But, but the exact way in which they do this is Im important. And fortunately, we have available more precise quantitative and even sometimes non-asymptotic bounds on the spectrum of these time-limited operators better than what we would get from, excuse me, from the general Sego's theorem. So here's something we were able to show in generality. Um, let's fix that bandwidth W. And we can show that, well, let me start with this picture down here. 
we expect that there will be a number of eigenvalues which are very close to one for our time limited operator. Actually, they can't go above one, but they can be very close to one. Then there will be a very sharp transition, and then the remaining ones will be very small, close to zero. The number, the quantity of eigenvalues that are close to one should be about two times W times T. That's our time bandwidth product. And we can state that formally with this asymptotic bound right here. And similarly, or also we should have very few or relatively few eigenvalues in this transition region between the ones that are close to one or close to zero. So the number of eigenvalues say that are between epsilon and one minus epsilon, we can prove that that's vanishingly small compared to the time bandwidth product 2wt over epsilon times one minus epsilon. So this is something that we can prove in full generality for locally compact abelian groups. And uh, even though we've specifically talked about time limits, which are between zero and T and band limits, which are between minus W and W, you can also break up those subsets to more general partitions of the time and frequency domains and, and have an analogous statement there. So I wanna say a little more about this, this transition band because this is a little bit of a weak result. It's general, but it's not as strong as we might like to just say little o of, of 2wt. And in fact, there are on a case by case basis, you can sometimes show that the transition band is uh, big O of uh, just the log of the time bandwidth product. So uh, that's a much sharper bound. It, it's been shown in the continuous time case uh, by Hogan and Lakey, and, and we have some results also in the discrete time Fourier transform case and the DFT case. Unfortunately, you cannot show this universally. There are counterexamples to being able to show that tr the transition band is just logarithmic in the time bandwidth product. Uh, one example is the two-dimensional DTFT. And then I also, to, to talk about this epsilon dependence, which appeared here in the denominator, um, we'd like to do a little better than, than little o of one over epsilon as well. And in fact, we can reduce that to a polynomial of the log of one over epsilon. This also has to be done in a case by case basis, but it's been done both for continuous time and discrete time settings. Uh, and again, both or, or now both asymptotically and non asymptotically. So there are bounds, non asymptotic bounds with, you know, specific formula up to a constant about how wide this transition band is with, with finite values of your time limit, capital T. So one application worth mentioning here, why, do we, why would we care about the, uh, the eigenvalues of these time limiting, uh, time frequency limiting operators? Think about the family of signals which are band limited. So, so here's a signal X of T, which is band limited by construction, where we're building it out of sinusoids with frequencies just ranging from minus W to capital W. And we're restricting the energy of these signals. Their spectrum has to have uh, L2 norm, which is less than or equal to one. And then we will observe these signals again, only between time zero and, and capital T. So this is yet again, uh, a sub family subset of capital L2 set of band limited signals in the unit ball, which we're observing only over a finite time interval. And we, we might be interested in the geometric properties of this. This has connections, for example, to channel capacity of a band limited channel that we're only able to use for a finite amount of time. Uh, so denoting this family of signals by BTW, the in width of this signal family is given by the square root of the nth largest eigenvalue of our time frequency limiting operator. So there's an exact correspondence again here between this spectral property and the, the geometry of this signal family. And so for this family of signals, you know, this is the, the end width. And, and what we might be interested in is, you know, what is the dimension? How big do we have to make our subspace dimension n, little n, so that this n width is small? You know, we could try approximating our signal family with a, a one dimensional subspace, but that might not be big enough to capture everything. So we can, you know, gener increase it up to a two dimensional subspace and then see if the distance is sufficiently small. So we basically want to choose little n 
at a point where lambda n finally becomes small. And you know, thanks to these concentration properties, we see that we basically need to choose this little n to be just a little bit bigger than 2w times t. That's the effective dimensionality of, of this signal family. And, and that shows up a lot. This time bandwidth product ends up appearing in many, many places in time frequency analysis. So I'm going to shift now from talking so much about the eigenvalues to actually talking more about the eigenfunctions or eigenvectors of these operators. These are commonly named by the no, commonly known by the name of Slepian functions. They have more specific names depending on the, the domain we're dealing with. In, in the continuous time domain, they're called the prolate spheroidal wave functions. In the discrete time domain, the discrete prolate spheroidal sequences, and, and so on. These are, they have very interesting and important properties. They provide an orthonormal basis. By construction, these functions are time limited, say between zero and T in continuous time. And they are very highly concentrated, extremely highly concentrated in the frequency domain between the frequencies minus W and W. You can also kind of flip this around. You can make them perfectly band limited in the frequency domain and highly concentrated in time and they are still going to be an orthonormal basis in that case. And these have many possible uh, applications spanning back decades. I'm gonna talk about some, um, some recent applications of these in, in just a couple of minutes in some signal processing contexts. They, they classically appear in something called Thompson's multi-taper uh, method for spectral estimation. Santosh and colleagues have a, a recent paper revisiting this topic, but uh, still using these Slepian functions. They allow you to solve problems like, given a finite collection of, of samples of a signal, how can you find a band-limited signal which extrapolates those, uh, but has the smallest energy possible? Um, Mark and I have used these in um, some compressive sensing problems in the past and, and so on. Here's Here's a theoretical result we can show about the approximation power of these Slepian functions. So um, actually everything I'm gonna talk about from this point forward will be in discrete time. So let's take, consider a, an important type of discrete time signal, which is just a sinusoid or a complex exponential here. We'll let EF denote a vector, uh, a complex vector of length N consisting of N samples of a complex exponential with frequency little f. And just think about the family of all such um, complex exponentials. So all EF that we might get by letting this frequency parameter range from minus w to w. This is a one-dimensional submanifold of, of Cn. So it's winding around a little piece of Cn. And again, we might be interested in knowing whether we can capture the energy in those signals well with a low dimensional subspace. In particular, uh, well, the answer is yes, and we can build that subspace out of these DPSS vectors, discrete correlate spheroidal sequences. We need a little more than two NW of them. We go a little past the point where those eigenvalues drop uh, from, from one to zero. We, we go out by basically a log factor. And then that gives us our DPSS subspace. And if we were to consider a orthogonal projection operator onto that subspace and say, how well approximated is every one of these sinusoids? We can approximate every single one of them uniformly across this entire frequency band with an accuracy of epsilon, as long as we've chosen our, our, uh, our, our dimension of this DPSS subspace uh, suitably well, according to the, the time bandwidth product, two times n times w. So because sinusoids are building blocks for many other signal models, being able to uniformly approximate sinusoids is, is really important. We've described this here for the discrete time case, uh, but as far as I know, it's an open question how well this type of result would generalize to approximating sinusoids on, on general uh, groups. I'm just about to move into some applications, but I want to mention one computational aspect here. I just talked about computing orthogonal projections onto a, a DPSS subspace. If you were to 
do those computations naively, the computational complexity would scale like n squared, where n is the dimension of your, your signal. Um, but we've been able to develop some fast algorithms. Uh, one of them we call the fast Slepian transform with complexity that's n log n, at least for computing approximate projections onto these DPSS subspaces. And uh, the idea, the insight that enables this is that these, these particular Toplitz matrices uh, in the time limiting case can be decomposed into a certain circulate matrix plus uh, a low rank matrix plus a small matrix, which we can end up ignoring. And the circulant and low rank matrices, they can be applied quickly to vectors um, thanks to their structure. And uh, putting all that together, that allows us to derive this, this n log n complexity algorithm. Um, so kind of FFT-like in terms of its computational complexity. So for the final part of the talk, there, there's really no theory uh, in, this, in the remaining slides, but these are more empirical applications of, of some of these ideas, specifically these Slepian functions and these DPSSs in some signal processing applications related to super resolution and, and radar imaging. So the first of these is what I call multi-band signal identification. So remember our, our notation for a sampled complex exponential EF. And suppose we build up a signal out of these things. So X here is gonna be built out of these vectors EF. We're, we're taking combinations of them, but we are only able to use frequencies within some subset uh, W of our frequency domain. And W here is constructed as a, a union of intervals of width 2W at, at unknown positions. So FJ here is gonna denote the unknown center frequency of the J interval. And based just on this sample vector X, we'd like to identify what are the locations of those band centers. So this is a, a really challenging problem. Let me give an, an illustration here. So think, let's start with panel C here on the right. Think of this as the continuous time Fourier transform of some analog signal that, that's going on forever in time. So it has a spectrum that's perfectly concentrated on a few disjoint bands. Um, and then what we're gonna do to that sample, that signal is we're going to sample it. We're just gonna collect a small number, in this case, 50 samples to create the, the signal that we show on the, um, on the left panel, the real parts in blue, the imaginary parts in red. And from these samples alone, we'd like to identify where the centers were of the bands uh, shown from our original signal. So the, the classical thing to do here is maybe you could window these samples, but ultimately you apply a discrete Fourier transform. Maybe you zero pad them as well. But the DFT spectrum will look something like what you see here in the middle panel. And you can generally tell where things are happening but you have all these side lobes. You really can't tell if there was active frequency content out there. You can't really tell where the boundaries were between the bands either. And so we were inspired here to think about the kind of the, the modern techniques from line spectrum estimation. Actually, this problem is hard, even if these were not bands here in the, in the original spectrum, but actually even pure spikes. And, and so people recently have been looking at using atomic norm minimization as a framework for uh, solving the line spectrum estimation problem. And we, we tried to extend those ideas to the multiband problem. We realized that we can write this sample vector X as a sum of, of terms, at least approximately, as a sum of terms of some sinusoid, which is pointwise multiplying or modulating some unknown vector. Uh, we don't know the center frequency of that sinusoid, and we don't know what this vector is over here, but we do know that this vector is gonna live in a basis of DPSS uh, vectors. So we know S, we just don't know GJ here. So because of the kind of um, constructive nature of the sum, we can define an atomic dictionary of atoms of the form sinusoid multiplying uh, an unknown vector in a DPSS subspace. We can define a semi-definite program for the atomic norm in that dictionary. We can look at the dual problem to that atomic norm minimization 
and use the dual solution to define a dual polynomial. And where we see the peaks in that dual polynomial, those are indications of what the active frequencies are at the centers of these bands. Here's one numerical demonstration where we had a signal length of 256. We had four occupied bands, each with a half bandwidth of one over 32. The true center frequencies are shown in red here, and the blue is, is showing the dual polynomial. So the important thing here is that this dual polynomial is peaking at the true, the, the true correct uh, four frequencies here. There's been some nice work by Isicard and colleagues um, in deep learning, uh, trying to develop deep networks which can mimic the behavior of these atomic norm minimization programs. What they're trying to do is actually train deep networks to output things that look like those dual polynomials. And we have attempted to do that as well in the case of these multiband signals to create and train networks that are able, given an input of one of these sampled finite samples of a multiband signal, can you output something like that dual polynomial, which is peaking at the true center frequencies. And we developed a network uh, inspired by theirs, but one thing that we added to this network is a, a long short-term memory layer, which allows us to accommodate input signals of varying sizes rather than having a fixed size. And we trained our network on signals of different lengths ranging from 25 to 50. And then we tested our network on signals with lengths ranging from 100 to 200. We had three active bands in our multiband signal. And actually two of the bands were overlapping in our experiment, which made the identification of their center frequencies uh, even more difficult. Um, our, the performance of our network is shown in blue. And just as a sake of comparison, the red and green are showing the, the performance of, of these other networks, which were intended for, uh, for line spectrum estimation rather than multiband spectrum estimation. So we see a nice improvement um, uh, thanks to the, the structure of our network here. A couple other applications um, of these ideas, one of them was in, in super resolution radar imaging. So uh, specifically synthetic aperture radar. So the, the idea in a synthetic aperture radar is that you have a collection of antennas or transceivers. Each one can transmit and receive. And let's just focus on one antenna for a moment. This is transmitting a collection of different frequencies and it's receiving some responses. And if you apply a Fourier transform to what you get back, you'll see a spectrum that looks something like what's shown on the right-hand panel here. And Actually, if each target that you were trying to image was a perfect point target, you would just see a perfect line. You'd, you'd get a line spectrum here on the right. And the positions, the, the frequencies in this spectrum are indicators of how far away that respective target was from the current um, antenna. We were interested in small but extended targets here where you don't just have a perfect point, but rather a, a small extended target. So in that case, the spectrum on the right is not going to be a line spectrum. It's going to be a, a multiband spectrum. And since we have not just one antenna, but a collection of antennas, we're actually going to have a different multiband spectrum for each one of these antennas because they're all going to have different relative distances to all of the, the targets there. But again, we're able to write an approximate model for our data matrix. We can build a matrix of sinusoids one column per antenna. And the frequency of that sinusoid is the distance from that antenna to some hypothetical xy point in space. And then this would be pointwise multiplied by a matrix whose columns all live in a DPSS subspace, but, but are otherwise unknown once again. So again, we'd like to try to set up an uh, atomic kind of minimization problem for signals of this form. The, the trick we used here was to express this type of matrix as uh, linear measurements of a certain structured tensor. And then we can use a semi-definite program, at least approximately, to minimize the atomic norm according to that structured model. We can still solve the dual problem and look for peaks in the dual polynomial. And I'll show the results of that in just a moment. Um, actually, the next slide 
was a sim simulation with nine antennas and we took 70 measurements from each of these antennas. And then uh, we, we had three extended targets that we were trying to find. In this top left panel, the locations of those targets are shown as these three black bars. So one, two, and the third one is right here. And kind of a classical back projection algorithm that's shown in color here is really doing a poor job of localizing where those targets are. If we just pretended the targets were points and applied a more uh, standard line spectrum based atomic norm program, the dual polynomial is shown here in yellow and it is really failing to localize the locations of all three targets. Um, we tried separately doing a multiband problem for each of our antennas and combining those solutions. This also didn't work very well. But when we do everything jointly with the formulation that I showed on the previous slide, we get a dual polynomial, which is much better at localizing the positions of all three of those targets. And the last application I'll mention here is one in um, beamforming. So beamforming is a problem where you have a, a array of antennas and you have a collection of signals that are coming into that array from, from different unknown directions. And so we can model such data um, as a sum of say the jth signal, which you may know or you may not know, times with the outer product of uh, the, the signal outer product with what's called the array steering vector. This is A here is just actually a sampled sinusoid whose spatial frequency is given by the angle of arrival of the jth signal. And the goal in a beamforming problem is that you want to construct a weight vector W that tells you how to combine the columns of your data matrix so that you approximately recover your desired signal. Let's say that happens to be the first signal, S S1. Well, a classical approach in beamforming is called sample matrix inversion, SMI. That actually assumes you know a pilot signal. Um, so S1 might, for example, be a pilot signal for calibration. And if you happen to know it, then you can apply the pseudo inverse of your data matrix to compute your weights. Uh, but more generally, you may not know what S1 is at all, or even if you think you know what it is, you might have some errors there. Um, in real electronic devices, you can have drift in the, in the carrier frequency of your transmitter, and that can even change over time. So that can make it difficult to properly calibrate systems like this. And SMI can fail pretty dramatically, even with small errors in your pilot signal. So we, under the assumption that all these signals are at least narrow band, we, again, were able to develop kind of an analogous version uh, to the models that I've shown on some of the previous slides. We can define an approximate semi-definite program for computing the atomic norm of our data matrix under this model. And the peaks of the dual polynomial tell us where these frequencies are. We can then use least squares to estimate the, the G components. We can put all that together to estimate our pilot signal and finally apply the SMI algorithm. We conducted some experiments here where we had frequencies that were changing over time relative to the, the carrier frequencies of our three signals that I'll show on the next slide. So for example, in this bottom right plot, every signal started at some frequency, but then it began to drift randomly around that value over time. The plots here are showing our dual polynomials. Um, for the sake of time, I, I won't say much about these, except that we are seeing good performance here in localizing the true frequencies of these unknown signals, both the intended signal and the interferers. And then this is the beam response, the array response of what we, what we achieve. And what we want for, is for these lines to be large in the direction of our desired signal. That's the blue direction here. And small in the directions of these unwanted interfering signals. Those are the ones in red here. And we see that SMI does a very poor job of that. But with our technique, we're able to you know, significantly improve upon it. So. I'll conclude here. In, in the three parts of this talk, I've talked very generally about time-limited toplets operators, why we care about them, what, what their importance is, for example, connecting to n widths, and what we know about the theoretical analysis thanks to things like Sago's theorem. We then specialized our discussion to time frequency and 
limiting operators um, for which we have stronger theoretical results available. And an important byproduct there are these Slepian functions. And then we use these Slepian functions for signal processing applications. The, the, a good takeaway here is whenever you might have really concentrated bands, the ground truth bands are very narrow or concentrated in the frequency domain, but you would classically encounter these leakage problems with the Fourier transform. These Slepian functions may be super handy for solving the problem that you're dealing with, whether it's in this case is whether super resolution or, or radar imaging. And I had a number of citations in the talk. I know this is being recorded, so I'll just put these on the screen now and uh, you're welcome to just uh, follow up later or send me an email if you'd like more information on any of these references. So thanks everyone for attending and if there's time, I'll be happy to take any questions. Excellent, thanks a lot for the, for the great talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, either put them in the chat uh, or uh, go ahead and un unmute yourself and, and ask, uh, ask live if you'd like as well. I'll open up the floor and see if anyone has any, any questions they'd like to ask. Okay, I can, uh, I can ask something related to um, uh, DPSS vectors that I've wondered. So I, I guess if, uh, if you want to use these in, in uh, applications you, in combination with um, compressive sensing techniques, I guess it's quite useful to know what the, um, orth the bounded orthonormal constants are for these types of vectors. So how, right, when you properly normalize what their sort of L infinity norms are uh, looking like when they're L2 normalized, do you know if that's known or if, what sort of results exist? Yeah, it, it really depends on exactly what you're doing. If you're, if you're kind of constructing them by doing the sampling of bounded orthonormal systems, you, you might um, need those. In, in some other cases, uh, you really can deal with just a normalized discrete version of these vectors uh, where you, you don't have to do that analysis. But sometimes, again, you may care about that. Um, yeah, there, even tracing back to the original papers by Slepian, there are results about the behaviors of these functions themselves. It's very case by case, whether we're talking about continuous time or discrete time. and um, I would say there's no clean answer. I mean, these things don't have closed form expressions for uh, just to start off with, which is unfortunate. Moreover, when you look at these papers, there's often like uh, different asymptotic approximations based on different ranges in time of the, the signal that you're talking about. So you don't even have kind of one hol holistic approximation to, to deal with. But I, I'm pretty sure that in those results, you would have the information that you need in order to come up with these L infinity bounds. Interesting, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions anybody else has before we, uh, um, we let Mike go? Um, there's a question about, um, uh, about uh, uh, SAR imaging and any particular relations to the to the Maxwell equation, uh, George Dow? If you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, feel free. Yeah, I think I get the gist of it, uh, George. Uh, so yeah, the connection to the Maxwell equation. So I think you could get into more sophisticated modeling of um, the electromagnetic phenomena that we're talking about here. We're, um, I think, probably compared to so the sophisticated modeling, we're making some simplifying assumptions here that uh, when you send a pure tone here, what you're going to get is, is a response, which is also a pure sinusoid coming back, but just attenuated by uh, kind of a reflection coefficient from your, from your device. You can get into more complicated modeling also. I've omitted it from these slides, but you could think about having a wall in between your radar and the um, 
and the, the targets which you're trying to image behind that wall. And then you end up with reflections happening inside the wall that complicate the response as well. So um, yeah, there would be, it would be interesting to know, and, and since I'm not an expert in that, you know, what are maybe the, the most artificial assumptions we're making and whether our mathematics could be extended to, um, to, to relax those assumptions. Uh, yeah, great. So there, it looks like there's, um, there's uh, another question uh, that was just posted um, by uh, Ag Agathoclis. Sorry. Um, if you want to ask, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, sure, yes. Um, uh, Mike, quick question with regards to your last example. Um, is You talked about beamforming but, um, application, but is this applicable to trace uh, time varying frequencies in non stationary signals, like um, responses from structures that yield or have time varying? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, uh, Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it would be relevant to that. Um, it's something we thought about once we started thinking about these frequencies that could change over time. Um, this is really not a, a one and done thing. If you wanna use beamforming in a practical communication system or something, you need to continue to account for the fact that these frequencies could continue to change. So um, I think that that's something we'd be interested in. Um, I mean, you could reapply our method every time step. I think we would be interested in something a little more clever than that, where you have a way of informing you know, the next iteration of an algorithm based on what you learned about what the frequencies were doing in the, in the previous iteration. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Mike, uh, this is Yuji uh, from CMU. Very nice talk. Uh, so I have a, a question about uh, how the deep learning based approach that you have showed, showed a little bit in your talk. Uh, compared to some of these more classical mathematical approaches that we are not we are all very familiar with, can you talk about those, you know, the pros and cons and the comparisons? Sure. Thank, thanks for the question, UJ. Um, yeah, these. So I think with multi-band, it's really hard to make comparisons because classical techniques don't really seem well suited for dealing with the the extended support of these frequency bands. Um, but we've also been working in the, the line spectrum setting ourselves. <clears throat> and we've also, in other work, we've introduced uh, damping. So sinusoids that are, that are damped and so their amplitude is decaying over time and tried to solve those also with these, um, these networks, these deep networks. So if I remember the conclusions correctly, these networks are pretty competitive uh, compared to these classical techniques. Um, I'd say the main drawback it seems to be at the highest uh, signal to noise ratios. Once your data becomes really, really clean, classical techniques really, you know, knock it dead, right? They, they can give you virtually exact answers. Um, but with these neural networks, you sort of hit a wall in terms of the approximation performance based on how deep your network was <clears throat> or how much training data you had. So um, when, you, when you show the sorts of curves like the ones I'm showing here, you can end up seeing some places where, where these performances cross at a high enough SNR. So I have a follow-up question. So when you train on neural networks, how do you generate your training data? Do you consider things like mismatch? Or, uh, you know, when, when you, uh, if you have this noise and say those carry frequency offsets, you also mentioned a little bit towards the end of the talk. If you have these things, uh, do you consider those in the training of the neural network or you just give it clean data? Yeah, I think I would call this clean data according to our multi-band model, um, except with additive noise. Uh, that's, and that's what's, we're, what we're referring to with the SNR label on the, on the horizontal axis on these plots. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.